All right. <clears throat> the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about how we manage our words. Your ability or inability to control your tongue is going to determine, more than anything else, the level of success that you enjoy in the relationships that you have. If you can't seem to say the right thing, and you constantly seem to say the wrong thing, you're probably going to most likely find yourself all alone someday, alienated from everyone in your life. And I would imagine most of us can think of folks that that has been the case with. Um, in, in, in their later life, they have no one just because of how they have used their words up to that point in their life. There are some people who find it easy to express themselves and and, and, and they have no trouble at all saying what's on their mind. We usually refer to these kind of people as brilliant conversationalists. Some of them can talk on and on and on and use countless words and never get around to saying much of anything at all. Insert your favorite politician here. <laughs> But we all know that there's more to speaking effectively than being able to just simply string words together. I'm sure you all will remember the Dick Van Dyke show. You all remember that show? Oh, yeah. yeah, great show. There was one show when Dick was at a party that was filled with all of these pseudo-intellectual type of folks. And he got trapped in a one-sided conversation with this literature professor. After the conversation, one of the other guests came up to him and said, isn't he brilliant? To which Dick Van Dyke responded, oh, oh yeah, he has the ability to say things which seem vague, but in reality are meaningless. <laughs> That kind of sums up the way a lot of people make their conversations. But the Bible teaches us a different approach to conversation. It teaches us to use our words sparingly and to speak with caution. Were you aware that the Ten Commandments contain 297 words? Psalm 23 has 118 words. The Lord's Prayer has 56 words. And yet the Department of Agriculture needed 15,629 words to discuss the pricing of cabbage. <laughs> so it's not the ability to use a lot of words that make a difference. It's being able to use the right words. We need to get into the habit of speaking carefully. We need to learn to think first and talk second. And so tonight I want us to focus specifically on the think first aspect of conversation. Before you speak, here are some things that you need to consider. First off, Consider saying nothing at all. Now, this point has three subpoints, if you will, to it. Okay? So I'm about to tell you three things that, if you'll take them to heart, they'll absolutely liberate you and revolutionize every relationship that you have. They all deal with not saying anything at all. Okay, so here goes. First, as you consider saying nothing at all, remember that you don't have to say everything that you know. In my junior year in college, I had come out of my shell a little more than I was when, when I first started, because I was very 
reserved, I guess you could say. I was having a dinner, having dinner at a restaurant with, with several of my friends, and we were reminiscing about things that had happened in the previous two years there at school that we had all been a part of. And someone mentioned a person who had graduated the year before. He was, I was going to say older, he was a senior when I was a sophomore, and most of the other ones there were sophomores. I was older than him um, just because I started school so late. But he had graduated the year before, and, and, and somebody had mentioned something that had happened with him, and, and we all laughed about it a little bit. And then I happened to say, happened to remark that I really missed him, because I did. He was a fun guy. I got along with him very, very well. And I mentioned how much I missed him and how much I admired him. Another person at the table said, really? Well, my aunt said that he was in an AA group that met at her church. Did you know that after he graduated, he started drinking and wasn't able to control it? Now, she didn't have to tell us that. For starters, there's a reason why those groups have the name anonymous in them. Okay? It's for people's privacy, and that needs to be respected. But secondly, blabbing that little tidbit really didn't build or edify our group up at all. It didn't bring glory to Christ. Just because you know something about someone doesn't mean that you have to spill it. You may know something about someone. And just because you know it, just because it's true, doesn't mean that you have to say it. If what you say doesn't build up others, doesn't bring glory to Christ, then you're better off keeping your mouth shut. Proverbs 17, 27 says, The intelligent person restrains his words, and one who keeps a cool head is a man of understanding. So before you speak, consider saying nothing at all, because you don't have to say everything you know. Second, as you consider saying nothing at all, remember that you don't have to say everything that you think. From time to time, I come across people who believe that they know a little bit more about every subject than anyone else in the room. And they believe that it's their duty to wax eloquently whenever the chance presents itself. Whichever subject comes up in a conversation, whether it's the stock market or computers or criminal justice or sports or politics or religion, they believe they have the first and final word on the matter. And of course, they also feel like they have to share it with you. Now, most of us can fall into that habit unintentionally. And so we need to be very careful. Once again, referring to a show, y'all remember the character of Cliff Clavin on Cheers? Anybody ever watch Cheers? Some of you might not have since it took place in a bar. Well, he's like this. No matter what subject came up in a conversation, he had something to say about it. He was a self-proclaimed authority on anything and everything. And he was also the subject of a lot of the jokes. I began to believe that, that just about every group of friends has someone kind of like Cliff Clavin in it. So as you look at your group of friends, think about who they are. If you don't recognize somebody like Cliff in that group, you might want to take a look at yourself. 
<laughs> you may be it. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent. He's discerning when he seals his lips. So you don't have to say everything that you think before you speak. Keep that principle in mind. Silence looks like knowledge. So remember to think first and speak second. And thirdly, as you consider saying nothing at all, remember that you don't have to repeat everything that you hear. The problem with repeating gossip is that there's a better than even chance that what you heard isn't really completely true. Gossip tends to get embellished as it's passed from person to person. I personally believe that the subject of gossip is one that we don't take seriously enough in the church. We say things like, I'm going to go over to my friend and catch up on the gossip. We say things like that. And I wonder how much of it is actually true, whether that's what we mean that we're going to do or not. We need to begin to take gossip seriously. You know what Proverbs says about gossips? Proverbs 16, 28 says, A contrary man spreads conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. Now the NIV says it this way, A perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. That's something new to think about. Did it ever occur to you that when you talk bad about someone, God considers those actions perverse? It may seem hard to believe, but that's certainly what's implied here. And there are several versions of, of this passage that I looked at that that's kind of how it came out. And in my opinion, the truer it is, the juicier it is, the more despicable it is to God when you repeat it. God would much rather that you keep quiet about it. Proverbs 17.9 says, Whoever conceals an offense promotes love but whoever gossips about it separates friends. So repeating everything you hear destroys friendships. That's why you need to think before you speak and consider whether you should say anything at all. You don't have to repeat everything you hear. So the first step to managing your mouth is to consider not saying anything at all. The second step is to consider whether or not you have all the facts. You all remember who Richard Jewell was? Got a few nod heads. That was head nods. Not not heads. Don't want you to get confused there. Choose my words here, okay? That'll come back to bite me, won't it? He was the security officer who first identified the bomb that exploded at the 1996 Olympics. Okay? Um, he, he acted conscientiously. He acted courageously. And he was in my opinion, a hero. And I think he was proved that that was the case. But as is typical in such events, the FBI developed suspicions about Jewel. And they began to consider him as one of the suspects in the bombing. I think the FBI was simply doing their job because they needed to suspect everybody initially. But the media 
went wild with the story when they found out about it. The Atlanta Journal, Journal printed a story that was packed with innuendo and misleading facts and comments. The New York Post called him, this is a quote, a fat former failed sheriff's deputy. And that story kind of crossed the line between reporting him as a possible suspect and simply declaring him as being guilty. Even Tom Brokaw compromised his credibility when he said they probably have enough to arrest him right now, probably enough to prosecute him, but you always want enough to convict him. Well, you know how the story turned out. He didn't plant the bomb, and they found who actually did. And, and the guy that they had found actually had set off several other bombs throughout the years at different other places. So he really was a hero. He put his life in danger to save other people. And he ended up getting ripped to shreds by the press. And this is one time, for once, that the media was actually held accountable because he sued all the media outlets that were involved with that, including NBC. All of the outlets settled out of court with Jewel for an undisclosed amount of money rather than go through the humiliation of a trial. When Richard Jewell died in 2007, he was thought to be worth $5 million. And that event can teach us a couple of things. Number one, just because Tom Brokaw says something doesn't mean that it's true. You need to remember that when you watch the news, there's a very real possibility that you're getting only a fraction of the story. And I think we probably all are aware of that. Another thing that it taught us is this. You can do a lot of damage by speaking before you get the facts. And some of the damage is going to come back to you. You may never find yourself in the kind of jam that NBC was in after reporting the lies about Richard Jewell, but you can be sure that if you open your mouth before you get the facts, there's a real good chance that disaster is going to come back at you, as well as possibly for anyone else that was involved. Proverbs 18, verse 13 says, the one who gives an answer before he listens, this is foolishness and, and disgrace for him. I think I've all told you about the lobbyists that I used to work for in Topeka. Portions. <laughs> I don't have time to go through everything that happened. Um, but she prided herself in being, being a very hard and a very difficult person to get along with. She found a lot of pride in that. And there was a printing company that we regularly did business with. They printed most of the newsletters of the associations and the organizations that we dealt with. The newsletters and the, and the convention brochures and all that kind of stuff. They were, they were our printer. And, and she was a hard negotiator. And so she negotiated down these, these very good prices on a lot of the things that we did there. Um, well, one time we were waiting on a newsletter to get back to the office uh, from the printer so that then I could stuff it with what needed to be stuffed with it and fold it and, and put the labels on it so that it could get sent out in the mail. And, and she was expecting it at a specific time on a specific date. It didn't happen. So she told me to call them. So I called them. 
And they said, well, no, it'll be here then. You'll get it at this point. And that's what I told her. She wasn't real happy with how I handled that situation. I wasn't forceful enough. So after I got chewed out, she then called the printer and started chewing them out. To which they tried to say, no, this is when you'll get it. And she said, well, that's fine, but every contract we have with you, you need to tear up because we're never doing business with you again. And the printer said, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's probably what was going through his head. <laughs> when they brought the newsletter, the owner of the printing company had with it the original note that she had sent where she had gotten the date wrong. And he got it to us on the date and time that she had asked. Well, she apologized profusely. And then said, that was my mistake. We need to continue with our business arrangement. And he said, I don't have a problem with that. But I tore up all the contracts, like you said. I'll be happy to come up with new contracts, but there's going to be a substantial increase. To which she agreed. So after jumping to the wrong conclusion and going off, it ended up costing her quite a bit of money because she represented about 10 different associations and we did monthly newsletters. That was quite a bit more money involved. Solomon said in Proverbs 14 verse 3, just the first half of that verse. It says, The proud speech of a fool brings a rod of discipline. That's why you have to think first and then speak second. Make sure that you have all the facts. Proverbs 17, 27 says, The intelligent person restrains his words. And one who keeps a cool head is a man of understanding. Speak carefully. Consider whether or not you have all the facts before you open your mouth. And then thirdly, before you speak, consider the best way to say what needs to be said. We don't live in a in a bubblegum and cotton candy kind of world where everything is, is just sweet all the time. There are times when you have to say something that may not be pleasant to say. But your words will carry more weight if you take the effort to say them well. Proverbs 15, 23 says a man takes joy in giving an answer and a timely word. How good that is. It takes effort and a lot of thought, I might add, to make sure that you say the right thing the right way at the right time. I saw a meme. You know, I'm big on memes. You know, I put those up during the uh, announcements, trying to find memes and stuff and put it up. But it said, a state trooper pulled me over and said, your eyes are red. Have you been drinking? I responded, your eyes look glazed. Have you been eating donuts? <laughs> then underneath that it said, we laughed and laughed. I need, mail, I need bail money. <laughs> 
Now that's an example of not thinking first. That's an example of not considering the best way to say something. I would suggest you not ever say that to a police officer. There's an old story about a man who fixed his wife a sandwich and one of the pieces of bread he used was the heel. And when he gave her the sandwich, she just exploded. She blew up. And she said, I am so sick of you giving me the heel on every sandwich that you make. You've been doing this for 20 years. Why do you insist on doing this to me every time? The husband looked at her and said, because the heel is my favorite piece. Yeah, see? Now, that guy knew the right thing to say. <laughs> Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Solomon said in Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up wrath. If you need to confront your spouse or your child or a friend about a problem, you need to take the time to find the right way to go about saying it. You need to ask yourself, how can I say this in such a way that it's going to build them up, encourage them to do what's best for them in the long run? I once had a woman at another church who said to me, my husband has a way of telling me to do things, and when he does, I want to do exactly the opposite. Obviously, that guy needed a little lesson on how to communicate effectively. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Look for the best way to say what needs to be said. When we speak to one another, we need to keep that verse in mind. As you know, we've been going through the book of Proverbs, looking at wisdom. And the Bible says a whole lot about speaking carefully. In fact, so much that we could probably look at it just that for three months. Scripture says a lot about how we are supposed to speak in controlling our tongue. Words have tremendous power. We need to make sure that we use them carefully. Proverbs 13.3 says, the one who guards his mouth protects his life. The one who opens his lips invites his own ruin. And Proverbs 10, 19 says, when there are many words, sin is unavoidable. But the one who controls his lips is wise. Now, I'm not saying you have to take a vow of silence. But all of us would probably benefit from making a commitment to think first and speak second. And while we're thinking, we can consider whether or not we should say anything at all. We can think about whether or not we have all the facts. And then what the best way is to say what needs to be said. In guarding our speech, we guard our lives, we strengthen our relationships, and we build others up to a closer walk with Christ. Next week, we're going to take a look <laughs> and handling conflict. Hopefully this message will bring about any. I guess I'll see. <laughs>
Um, but that's what we're going to look at next week is 